you're logged in, tuned in to T True Thoughts, and I'm joined by special guest DJ Fingers from the Syndicate, aka Carl. So this is part one of an interview. We're going to be talking to um, Carl, DJ Fingers, about the Syndicate, Bad Meaning Good, the classic UK documentary, and your journey signed to a major label virgin um there's a part two that we've spoken about already um, i've ha had an interview earlier with carl uh, which you can separately check which is about the initial story of carl talking about his mum borrowing money to get him turntables when he was really young really fascinating stories being jazzy b soul to soul in the early days spat a classic uk daytime um hip-hop night um, radio mixing in the early days of making music, a couple of releases on Bad Records. So if you want to find out more about that, um, check part two of this interview. But we're going to move into now, I guess um, maybe a good place to start will be the, Cole, um, thank you for joining us, but Thanks. maybe for me, the, like the day one part of where I first saw you and um, uh, heard about you as in performing was a classic UK documentary called Bad Meaning Good, which came out in 1987. It was on mm -hmm. shown on BBC, I think prime time as I recall. Was it BBC One or BBC yeah, One? It, yeah, it was called Hip Hop Arena, BBC, no, Open Spaces, sorry, Open Spaces. And I think, I think I could be quoted wrong, but I believe it was the first time a woman had produced a program. That was the first female oh, yeah. produced program on on um on bbc bbc2 i think it was like between seven and eight or eight and nine yeah, yeah it was on quite BBC early two. wasn't it Open I remember, spaces, yeah yeah i remember being excited watching it going to school the next day and yeah. everybody talking about or talking about it with my friends and you know just see, seeing that footage so yeah. you were involved with it as part of um your group the syndicate yeah and, um so yeah just let let us know a little bit about what I mean, was going like, we, and how you ended up on that we, yeah like we spoke about that that period just before yeah. and uh when i had uh, taken over spats i did spats with family quest but as mixed masters we were we were given the reins of spats and then because i always wanted to dj with mcs i asked family quest even though i'd met them in the place in spats prior i asked him look let's do this thing together and we did it for a while and, and spats, i just, think just to remind everybody yeah. was a daytime club that went on in on a saturday room, saturday, saturday lunchtime saturday. Yeah, yeah between saturday 12, 12. West, westwood did it initially and then he asked you to take it over he was going yeah he had handed it here because yeah. he he did a rap competition at the wag club in 1985 a national rap competition that junior g was the single rap winner and i believe cookie crew was the group winner um, and um, at that time, he probably thought it was too, it, it, it was not big enough. So he went, maybe did a few things like at Electro Ballroom, you know, Run DMC and other things at that time. So he was like, okay, he was going to do the Wag Club, I think, on a Saturday lunchtime. So he said, look, um, you can you can take this over. And um, at the time that we were doing that, we just carried on doing it and like I was saying to you with the by the time around that time I'd met Noddy in in uh he was coming to spats at that period when we had taken it over and then I told him that you know that was my vision uh ambition to make make music and uh we kind of had that that def definition of us you know but we can talk about that later what we defined the syndicate and the vision we had for the for the group but um I was doing a lot of stuff with a sound system that um, Cool Cash's brother was in the sound this sound system called um, Soul Incorporated, and they were like the sister sound to Mastermind, and they were based in sort of Halston, Kensal Rise, and um, they I used to do a lot of uh, sound system things with them, like um, just do little uh, displays of like you know, cutting up soul records. And they were like an older crowd, like uh, dressed up nice, you know, mature um, black crowd playing you mature soul. You were there as a younger DJ. Yeah, like just as like a little novelty. I wasn't yeah. really doing a lot, but they put me on and say, okay, cut these up. And, you know, it's just like a little novelty thing. What, what tunes were you cutting up? Can you remember? Um, it, it was any, anything that... Um, it's hard. It's hard to uh, to pinpoint something, but 
could have been like uh, definitely wouldn't wouldn't have been maze but nothing oh the obvious stuff like before I let go but it could have been like uh, don't let love get you down stuff like that just cut doubling up um, uh, to be real maybe encore you know this yeah. thing you know the sort of uh, groove groovy stuff at the time um, and um, Cool Cash was the, the MC he was the MC that never recorded has the syndicate but you know, we we were literally, ne uh, you know, in the same lived in Tottenham together. We were always in se we were inseparable. So that's the main things that we used to do together as well. MC and over, he would be MC and over that stuff. But around that time, we probably still was rubbing shoulders with with Westwood because Westwood was uh, this is like eighty six, eight early going into eighty seven. They might use him as a DJ as well. In in the parties, some of the parties that they were doing, or events, bank it was like banqueting suites and things like that, where they would be doing their things um, in the evenings, um, Saturday evenings. Uh, uh, and would that what, be because what, you you couldn't really hire clubs or anything like that? Yeah, at that time, yeah, it definitely was a thing. But there was there was um, certain places like uh, the Peoples or uh, uh, there's a place. It was like quite, quite a grimy place. Like we had a place in Tottenham called Shady Grove, but they, there was a place that I can't remember the name. If it's the People's Club, could have been, and um, uh, they might have had a residency there anyway, like Soul Link at, at the time. But there was, it did feel like there was a lot of banqueting suites that they would be hiring to do stuff. But the the way the bad meaning thing came about, so like after I'd taken over Spats, I, I always had, I must say because of all the stuff that's going on with Westwood was that I, I was in a, a unique situation where like Westwood always offered us things like as mix masters offering us Spats. It was just like, I generally think that he liked, he saw what we were doing and liked, liked us and we were humble guys. Um, he um, he offered us that and we took it. But I never really hung out with Westwood to know that I could see or witness anything. Um, and at the time that bad meaning good was, was an idea that I think was being made, Westwood uh, rang me and said to me, uh, I'm making this documentary and I want you to be the DJ. And he said to me, there was a few other DJs that would have that want to do it, but I had no idea that he was even making it. And he said, "I want you to be the DJ." So it's it's kind of like you know it's humbling that at that time that I would be asked to be that 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 person. And, so and it was a pioneering thing at the time, yeah. wasn't it? Because it was it was quite a mainstream thing. You were very young. I, I mean, even just from for me from a personal point of view, I mean, it's a uh, the image, I mean, it's directed really well. It's just a normal looking house, yeah. not a flash house, you know, from the window. You, you yeah. mentioned earlier, you're from Tottenham. I mean, yeah. for me, as someone who came from re re relatively poor background, it sort of gave me hope. It's like, oh, you've got turntables and you're, you're not living in a you know, huge house. So is there, you're like, yeah, me, me and my brother, me and my yeah. brother's bedroom, yeah. which is now my sister's room, Hazarina. <laughs> but me and my brother shared that room and the turntables were on the wall. Uh, uh, by the wall and uh, basically um, something that I've never never it's never been known but I think I, I had a lucky accident with making that clip for Bad Meaning Good because I think the cameraman he was famous for doing working with David Attenborough and he he uh, he's in my bedroom with Sue and they're like and Sue's like okay sh t show us what you do and they put the camera, this, and you can imagine these old school massive cameras, like and and the light, and it's right up in front of your face. And they're like, "Yeah, okay, tell us what you do." As uh, and every time they they were cut, they were filming, recording. I just I was like nervous energy, like I laughing with nervousness, like I couldn't do it. And it was this was going on for like twenty minutes, and the cameraman was like saying to Sue, "I can't work with these amateurs, like." This is like, no, just give him one more chance. So it was almost like make or break. And I just had this idea. I said to Sue, why don't you film me? Just film me DJing. And then you can ask me what I do uh, without the camera. And then you can put it over what I do. So if I didn't, 
you know, because of the danger of not even being in the documentary, if I didn't suggest that, it, I wouldn't, I would, it would have been that or nothing. I would not have been in this documentary. But it, it worked out. It was like a happy accident. Yeah. And it, it was worked. a cl classic piece of footage, wasn't it? I, I, I know even for me at that time, it, it, you were cutting initially um, uh, Ike's Mood, Isaac Hayes, wasn't it? Which is, I guess, a yeah. sort of classic nowadays would be seen as a classic. Yeah hip-hop record but you also did Tom Jones it's not unusual and yeah. I think that was that brilliant it, it, you know it's a real different levels of things you weren't you were just doing something yeah. that was almost quite fun but making it sound fun it, it kind of was a secret out, isn't it? Yeah. It, it Rob it's funny because it's kind of like a trade secret like up until uh, not to disappoint disappoint anyone or this this mystery uh, it was like a secret up until a couple years ago. Like uh, Adrian Charles did a did a, a feature on it, like uh, maybe around 2018 on on Radio Five, and Sue and Cookie Crew and maybe the Beatmasters. They were all being interviewed, and maybe um, a graffiti artist Pride as well. And they, the, he, Sue mentioned that she gave me that record, um... and she asked me. And she, I think she, she had said she got permission. She got, Tom Jones was aware of it and he got permission. But it wasn't like, I didn't choose the record. Oh, but she was like, because I, I had like, uh, when you watch the live bit with Noddy and, and me cutting, you hear Breakthrough, which is another Isaac Hayes record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but actually, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It's a, uh, no, it wasn't Joy. I'm thinking of Joy. But the record that you actually hear me cutting, uh, isn't actually what I was doing. I was actually using Apache. Oh, okay. it was like yeah, because that's what I noticed. I looked at the clip the other day. And it looked, was it from an Ultimate Breaks and Beats as well? Was it the Apache? Or was it? The... Yeah, the Apache yeah. was. Because that's it, what I thought. Probably it like Octopus. A... It might have been. Yeah. If it wasn't, yeah, it probably was the original Ultimate. The original, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Origin, yeah. original ultimate breaks, breaks okay and beat. so that, that's how because I mean if, to me I mean you made it sound funky even the Tom Jones yeah thing. they they, they asked me because they, they yeah. didn't want to clear all the records that I wanted to use and that's was like okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like <laughs> like what's funny is like um there's Jimi Hendrix like the one that's such scenario they made scenario with it much later like mm -hmm. I always think ah oh, people never mention like the Jimi Hendrix or or the um people realized because of the cover was there the gary newman gary newman as well but yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 so it's probably stuff they had access to and like bbc yeah. blanket agreements they do yeah, nowadays, yeah. So they sort of no look i went ott there was about eight eight records that i had that i had done and they said it's too much you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> So that I mean that that was a, so what was the what what did so that that documentary was really showing I guess the UK scene as it was beginning to go on so that you know you know it, yeah there was still at that point the combination American accents but the British accent coming through for you which we talked about on the earlier interview you were you were pushing things as a DJ you were one of the earlier ones and there you know I, as, as I said it previously alongside yeah. a bunch Massive Attack Soul to Soul really cutting up and doing that mixing the scratching you, you were an early sort yeah of I, 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 I um I could have gone down another road like um as early as 80 85 the first DMC championship um, before we even took over Spats. Um, the first DMC championship was um, was being held in the UK. He was in Zenons. And I knew of DMC from Radio Luxembourg. They 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 it wasn't as cutting edge as um, Kiss FM, but they did have these sort of mega mixes. Like you might be a George Benson mega mix, and when I was in my school days, you know, like someone like Froggy and and Herbie, I was like, okay, not that they, I would say they're my contemporaries, but I'm a school kid. They're on a platform, and I'm thinking, well, I, I'm I'm doing this stuff, but these these I'm listening to these people and admired Herbie, and uh, on um, uh, what was Invicta Radio on a Wednesday night, and then on a on a Sunday afternoon and then Froggy I would hear on JFM and the, these were other people that I would be hearing mixing and thinking like okay like yeah this is this is uh, you know I'm in this world but like I said they were known I was I was nobody but um yeah what, sorry I, I missed what, what, yeah. what was it so what was it like for you what was the um it was a different era like pre-internet 
um, a timing. What was it like? I mean, to have a documentary with you on there, did, did things change drastically after you were on that? It's that weird time? because, oh. um, like, at that time, like I mentioned before, Andy Shaft and Kid Lawrence, Kid Lawrence used to play with us at Spurs. And, like, he, he, he was championing maybe the early house and because he knew Eddie Richards and Colin Favor, I was aware of them. Like I'd go to places that they played because at that time I was able to get out of the house. So I, I would just be in venues, even if I didn't like what I was hearing. But the, um, when that was made and it was televised, I, I remember just sitting in Linny Lynn's house in, in West Green Road at the time and watching it. But, as as it was um, being aired, I think I had the opportunity to start going to France, but to go to Paris, like, and that used to be a venue that, like I was saying, like Cherage, and I do that every Friday night. And then it's a place as big as Electric Ballrooms. It held about 800 people. And it was the same thing. It was like the breakdance culture, but the music, they... Um, they the music uh, at that time, which arguably we would say that eighty eight was the golden era because we had we were more it was more danceable and music was was uh, varied but similar. So you had like obviously the Def Jam, but you, there's so much music that you could actually dance to. So a lot of the people they, they weren't necessarily break dancing anymore, but they still had the break dance culture in 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 front in Paris. So. I think at the time that we did, um, we already filmed Bad Meaning Good. Maybe it wasn't broadcasted, but I was invited from being doing the spats thing, being invited to come there. And um, we, we brought a few people over, even though we didn't have, we weren't friends and really, but we were all in the same culture. We, you know, London Posse came, came to Paris to do a show, uh, Richie Rich. He was still an uh, active DJ who I didn't acknowledge before, an uh, uh, active scratch DJ. But I always saw myself was, as a that DJ. Was, was that every week in, in Paris? Yeah, in Paris, oh, yeah. I, yeah. Sometimes I'd stay there. I, I might leave on a Thursday and I'd come back on a Sunday. And then if I came back on a Sunday, I'd go to African Centre because because uh, Emix, I brought Emix there. Emix became from Family Quest. He became a mainstay. I think I even brought... You went to Harry. Sons Bowl on a Sunday, basically. Yeah, yeah, I think I might go. But I wasn't a regular. Yeah. I wasn't a, a regular at, at, a lot, at a lot of these things. But I, I remember because of Andy, I would start to go. But I went to Soul to Soul when they did things in, like, in local, like in Finsbury Park or, or in Archway or local and then jazzy was always a cool guy i might have like five friends with me and jazzy would be like yeah let 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 um let let fingers in and his people and then um african um dance wicked which was like under the arches on a friday night you know that's people like, Nelson, is that right dance wicked i think it dance wicked not uh not dance wicked was um uh, uh she became our manager jackie davidson but she owned that that, that place but it was soul to soul on a friday westwood ah, okay westwood well, did it as well okay i don't know if we've said already but like like i was saying that relationship i had was um even when westwood offered me bad meaning good you know it's like the elephant in the room was like i never really hung out with westwood i was always like this homeboy i didn't really have have uh at the time there was no, there was no rumors, you know, around eighty seven, eighty eight. There was no rumors because Westwood oh. is accused of, you know, there's some really serious accusations. Going yeah, to there was no rumors at that time. <laughs> yeah, but and even at that time, I wasn't someone who hung out with Westwood. It was like, I was, I was a bit of a nerd in 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 the culture. Like I just loved doing what I did, and it, a lot of the time, like I said, if I weren't performing, like Family Quest did some major shows, but because. And I was part of, I was Family Quest as their DJ, but because it was just a PA on the stage, I wouldn't even want to go to it. I, 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 I found that aspect of the culture, it kind of bored me as a nerd, like a bit, a bit like Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man, matchsticks on the floor, like get, you know, getting, having an episode. Like I, I, I didn't want to listen to PAs. I, I liked 
that part of the, the raw culture, like you know, the breaks and the MCs and that sort of stuff. I mean, in a way, you weren't one yeah. of them, almost the not, that, not that one is better than the other, yeah, you know, yeah. So that, but you're that's just... what introduced me to the culture, and that's what I like to do. And I didn't, I didn't want to go and see someone do a PA, so even though they were my friends, I would be like, okay, if I wasn't involved in it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even necessarily go. Yeah. Because, I mean, for me, that's what I remember about Westwood, you know, even pre, pre Bad Meaning, because I used to listen to him on LW, and it, it really was a bit of a nerd, and uh, yeah. I always remember, you know, him hitting the microphone on his head and really stumbling, and then someone sent a, a, a clip of that over the Roxanne B, and yeah. he played things like that. He wasn't necessarily trying to, you, you can see that develop, that persona almost developing as bad, yeah. bad meaning good, definitely. And then obviously, yeah. with the accusations that have gone on, it, you know, it's gone into a whole, whole different world. But it, it was all very new at this point, I think. Absolutely, was, yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I, I must say that um, that if there's anyone in the whole culture that that I probably am, I'm the person that hung with Westwood, not at all. I'd say every other person had hung out with him, you know, worked with him, yeah. uh, signed to him. Like, me and a lot of people don't know, me and Freshkey, like Mo Rock and Freshkey, we were, like, the first groups that were invited to sign to his label, like, as early as he set up the label. And he was telling us, Brian Chuck knew. You know, we had offers from Beat Masters before Cookie Crew, around the same time as Cookie Crew. But I was always one... I was always, like, I'm a DJ, I'm a producer. I already had that desire lost through Family Quest. So we were like, we, we weren't going to just give it up and let somebody produce us because we went out and performed. We we saw what we did at that stage as we'd go out and do performances. Even though we didn't make records, we were, you know, I'd be cutting up and, then, and the rappers would be rapping. And then we'd get offers from Beatmasters, Westwood were off. Before he made Bad Meaning Good, he was like, look, I want to, I want, I want, I want you guys to sign. I remember having a meeting with, and he was saying this guy called Brian Chuck New, who went on to do, do big things. Um, he, he's the, the guy who would be partly the producer, but we didn't, we didn't want that. I didn't want that for myself. It was like the earlier interview you've explained. Yeah. And that's why we didn't do the thing. Co-production. And, and I guess yeah. that's probably something for me, I guess it's a way to move on to, the syndicate signing to Virgin. Yeah. For me, that was one of those things when you came out, when when those releases on Virgin, there was just a sound that it was different to everything else going on. It, you felt yeah. like you were in, it was, there was a syndicate sound and a syndicate, almost to an extent that Massive Attack had done and, you know, Soul yeah. to Soul. They all almost had their own sort of sounds. Okay, like it's hip hop fusion influence, but between all three, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, they're all a little bit different. There's the overlaps, but you've all got a sound. It's it? a very good connection with the three of us. Uh, I, the other uh, artists that maybe are not mentioned, they've got a different story, but um, I'd say that my, I learned this word through Freshkey is very intelligent academic guy he um taught me this word superfluous uh we, we you know if someone doesn't know the word it means like you don't need to say the word twice so it's like oh so i've i've always thought when i my understanding of hip-hop is encompassing everything has a dj i play anything and it's the way that i play it that makes it hip-hop so um when I hear these words like hip house or or reggae hip hop, I always think it, 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 it hip hop's enough. It says enough with hip hop because there was a period, even say like in reggae, I'd be a kid like um, like going like uh, seventeen, walking, not even eighteen, walking with a Technics turntable and my other friends walking with the other one, trying to get to the to the tube station and. Older guys that were in an, another scene, that uh, some of them were MC, uh, reggae MCs. They would be like, "Like, what are you doing with these two turntables?" And they would just be amazed that you're using these records and doing this thing. This is before the TV or whatever. You know, this is like '85, and um, they, they, if they wanted, they could have, you know, they could have maybe uh said i'll be gonna just take them from you but it, it's like they kind of were like 
like uh, empowering me to like, yeah, 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 he's he's different, but yeah, we like what he's doing. But the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is to say at that time, um, uh, the reggae scene and sound systems only used one turntable. And even if they used the double turntable, it was they were only using one of the turntables. So it was like my thing that I'm trying to stress is like, to me, I see hip hop as the technique as a DJ, I'm not an MC, so the technique of cutting cutting up on the sorry, cutting up on the ones and twos, you know? And um uh it it it, it, it everything is game. Everything is game. So now sampling is the word that's used, but at that time we will just take the records, whatever we have, and we'll make doubles out of it, you know? We'll make See, with doubles, we'll make we'll make music, which I was trying to explain in the documentary, and you know, yeah. So you were saying, as I mentioned, Soul to Soul Massive, you said one other group as well. Who, yeah, who? um, uh, like uh, like Massive Attack. I, I'd say the similarity, like at the time that um, they they were trying to predict like who is going to be the guys in the night is it was like um say like young disciples but that it, it's a little a bit of a different i'd say a little bit of a different angle because young disciples weren't coming from hip-hop culture you know at that time there was a definite there was a definite thing with okay that's a dj soul to soul and massive attack are similar because nelly was this one of the de scratch DJs of Massive Attack, and then he went to be part of Soul to Soul. So Soul to Soul, they had that 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 uh, aspect came into it. But um, my my I always thought that because in the reggae sound systems, like I admired when I heard like people friends around us that were like they they didn't really necessarily respect the hip hop what we were doing because the dancing and all of that but they they were like okay um they had sing jakes people who sang over the music and I, I liked a lot of the stuff that I was hearing that they would play and I always thought and from the days of spats with Noddy we were like you should be able to do that in hip-hop and you listen to the early records that we the electro records that we were playing like Shannon you know and things like Joy Sims later on, you know, and un, 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 unmentioned records that Mantronics even made, like uh, remixes or things that he produced, Nosera, uh, Take Me to the Water, you know. There was, there was always, like, um, vocal-based music, like uh, Nunk, you know, Walk Nine, and um, uh, Master Down Committee. There was always songs that, you know in the early days of the before like you said we used the term hip hop that that had that had the the um, the vocals in it so we always had that vision me and Noddy always spoke about the, for the syndicate we had that vision to bring in all the aspects of of uh, what we had in the sound system culture uh, so and that's UK why, influence really yeah and that's why yeah, even someone like spiky t yeah. Yeah. He literally just lived around the corner from me. I always, always bumped into him. But originally, he was with so he was with um, Noddy was uh, Spiky T was with Demon Boys. You know, even the original Crack Business, uh, Crack Don't Smoke Crack. He made that with uh, as a demo with the Demon Boys uh, producers, Twilight Firm. But we we're all family because Twilight Firm, Stevie G, he's the uncle of of Lenny Lynn. And we all we all kind of knew each other. Demon Boy. Um, Demon Boys were Tottenham as well, is that right? Yeah, Brian B. Yeah. Uh, Devastate, I would say, was Gary's gone on to be an amazing DJ. But uh, prior, you know, he was through knowing Brian and Stevie. Brian B. is the Twilight Firm producers. He's he's the D, he's the older brother of Gary. So Gary knew of me, but I'd never met him because he was a bit younger. But because I became close with Brian, just going to the house, literally around the corner, I'm I'm the road around the corner from me. I could walk in and out of, you know, we were in and out of each other's house by the time we got to know each other. And uh, me and Gary, devastate, we became inseparable. And like, you know, they he, he went on to get a deal it was quite kind of funny because they had a deal before we even had a deal with Bad Records. And um, we could see that everybody, you know, sometimes I'd meet Noddy. Noddy was the postman for um, uh, John Peel at BBC. 
I'd always be at Oxford Circus, meet him every day for lunchtime. He had a long lunch break and we'd rap about vision for stuff. We'd walk through Covent, might bump into business. Business was someone who, from the Spats days as a dancer, and then he became an amazing DJ. We were always, always cool. If I saw him anywhere, we'd be cool. And we, we, were, we were speaking about it because at that time, my memory, someone like Schooly D was breaking through. And we would say to each other, everybody's going to be signed. We could just see that everybody's everybody's going to, this thing is is going so big that everybody will, will have. But my vision with Noddy was always, it wasn't necessarily just like, oh, we're, we're a rap group. It was like, we're a hip hop group. So we can bring in all the all the elements, you know, the vocal it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't strange to us. Yeah, it was just and, fusing everything. Yeah, <clears throat> so Spiky T, we brought Spiky T in, and we recorded. We had this idea, and we made we we we, we made live the life, we're just messing around in in uh, Ron Tom's uh, studio, like through Eddie Richards, because he was being so busy uh, in '89, and I had a bit of angst with my um, with my stepfather, and I, I I literally had to be out of the home. So I ended up living in a flat, uh, even though I could have just stayed with my uncle, um, who the family called Brother Lloyd. So you know that that that's where the name Brother Lloyd comes from, from from the um, from the the one of the tracks that we've got. <clears throat> but my uncle um, lived in Stokey, but I I didn't want to. I wanted to show a bit of. Um, def defiance, so I just stayed in Ron Tom's studio. And literally during the day, I might go home, rush home when my dad wasn't there and then I'd have a shower and then I'd go back in Kentish Town. So I just, we lived in and out of the studio, me and Dunk Ramp, and we just put down ideas. And the first track you, was Live the Life. Were you signed by then? Were you signed? No, signed no, this is 89. Okay. We had no idea. We didn't have no vision to be signed or anything. It was just yeah. like, we're yeah. in a studio. Yeah. Eddie, yeah. In, Eddie Richards introduced us yeah. to, to this thing. Can I just rewind um, one little, little yeah. bit, just because you yeah. mentioned Noddy and John Peel. So, yeah, you, was John Peel playing your tunes then? Were you sending it? Um, I think you like it's a really funny thing. Um, T. Laroc played at uh, Kentish Town. I think it could have been. I don't know if it was Town and Country or what's now called Coco, uh, in the more in Crescent part of Ken Camden. Um, I don't know what that venue was called, but I think Teela Rock was doing his Dave Pear special. And we, because Noddy was the postman, at B, uh, especially people like Dave Pearce, uh, sorry, John Peel, we were, uh, Jonathan Ross, finally enough, done the show. Jonathan Ross wasn't famous then. He done the show for 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 John Peel. And we, uh, Noddy said, look, I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm invited to... To um, to MC with uh, come on the show, so we went and did and did this recording. And so they, Jonathan Ross was the DJ, you say? Yeah, Jonathan Ross stood in oh. for John Pill. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, I've got the recordings. I'll try and get it get yeah. it to you. Like and Noddy, they put on. He said, "Look, we've got this because the rapping thing was a, still a bit like okay, this is a, a new thing." And he said, like, T. Laroc, uh, we've got this guy, he's our postman, but he's a bit of an MC as well. So people had known known uh, Noddy in, in the BBC by then. And this would have been, we hadn't even done Bad Meaning Good, so it could have been 86. Oh, yeah. Wow. Or eight, it could have even been 87, but we hadn't filmed Bad Meaning Good. And T. Laroc, um and Noddy, they, they put on the instrumental of uh, It's Yours, and they were both rapping. And I, I was saying to Noddy, like, uh, because of someone like Cool Cash and the whole Treacherous Free thing, I kind of knew a lot about T. Rock anyway, through the Mantronics pr projects as well. So when he was emceeing, he wasn't emceeing freestyle. He was emceeing other lyrics from other records that he had made. So I was saying to Glad, don't freestyle. Like, do do your lyrics, because that's what he's doing. So by the second time around, like, when he was trading for the second time, he did he did his thing. And then after after um, we did we did uh, the performance, Teela Rock was really cool. He was like, yeah, come come and hang out with me. I don't, he had the DJ, I don't know. It wasn't Louis Louis, but it was a guy, I think that was his name. But he wasn't the one from Masters, you know. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So, for people who don't know, Tila Rock is the first ever Def Jam release. Is that that's? Quite, yeah, it's yeah. yours. It's yeah. yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rick Rubin. Yeah, and Jazzy J. Yeah. But he um. He asked us to come and hang out with him, but we were we said we 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 were always a bit nervous to be seen with people. So we were like we appreciated and we were really happy that yeah. we had had that experience. And we said that maybe people would hate on us if they see us with you. So we said we were just rich. So we never we were weird. You know, we were young. We were young and, and also you weren't had on a different. Part it wasn't a party vibe. It was really the music and the culture was all yeah. you were focused on, wasn't it? There wasn't yeah, yeah. a lot, like, oh, I can, we can go in just party and party. Yeah. And party. It was more... We were just happy that we'd done that. But we, yeah, we yeah. later on, yeah, you know, decades later, people tell, tell me, someone even, a guy in Scotland said he recorded it and gave it to me, gave it to me maybe 20, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But um, yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear that as well, if you do. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%, yeah. So, so with 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 um, so you you you're, you're just recording now in the studio. Yeah, so you've been pre signing, so you're just getting the music together. Yeah, live the life was one of the early tracks we did because yeah. yeah. um, after the second, the first EP, we had that vision. I always used to just bump into Spiky T in Tottenham and the back streets. His mum literally lived a couple of roads further. And he could see like he wasn't really going to get the the come up with um, with Demon Boys, um, especially Twilight Firm, like in in a rush. So I said to him, "Look, why don't why don't we try and do something together?" And at that time, I was very much around the 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 I'd say Rusters in Tottenham. Like they had um, a place called Black Vision, which was a, a video. Uh, video uh, hire place but the guys who ran it they were called uh, the place was called Black Vision and um, they used to do film all the dance hall videos and all the stage shows in Jamaica and they took a liking to me because they had they had a competition a few years before a scratch competition and they filmed it and the guy Hope he took it on he he really took a liking to me and he was saying look I'm going to build a studio one day and I'm going to allow you to take care of it and they created a pirate station and because everything happened all at the same time it's like they got to hear about the the tv program but it wasn't immediate and they they had seen it and they said like look we we want to help you and i i they i was very young and a lot of older people they allowed they gave me the privilege of being deputy manager of this radio station that they and they got me to uh, help run it. Amazing. So probably no. community spirit. Yeah, they, yeah. They seen the spark it was a, it was a pirate that, station, but at yeah. that time you could you could get you could do it, you know, eight eighty seven, eighty eight. So I spent a lot of time with them and it became natural. They used to laugh when we'd play like like um, I don't know, like Keras one, sorry, like stuff like that. They'd be like, "No, nah, this is not real stuff." But obviously, I'm hearing. I knew, I knew the music, the real music. But they were like, "No, nah, no." Nah. And what was the pirate station called? What, can you, what was the it? Was called that? Euro Jam. Yeah, mm -hmm. Euro Jam. Yeah, it was like, um, yeah, it was, it was for 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 that area of North London, Tottenham. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe the age of the people would say they know. But they had like. They had like prominent people on there, like uh, who are still still now going. You know, um, I'm trying to think of his name. West the best, um, uh, El Numero Uno. He's a big big DJ in the in the you know in the bigger bigger people, black black music. You know, he's a, we consider a reggae DJ, but he will play the mature mature music. Um, yeah, these people are still still going, but the the people I was rubbing rubbing shoulders with. So, and, um, so, yeah. so in the studio, you you've done lived the life, and so how? Yeah, and then in, in the studio, we met we met um, met Louise in the studio. She was recording out of that studio, and um, uh, we, we she liked what we were doing. Um, so we we just had the idea of let's make make a song together. Which the original song was "Tell Me Why." And then so slow down because slow down was originally two roughs, which is on the album. And then we, uh, Louise had uh, written written that. And um, and I think that's not mentioned because it's hard to know. Like Noddy actually wrote "Tell Me Why" 
and Slow Down with Louise. Both of them songs were written together. Not not because Noddy rapped in the song of Tell Me Why. They actually wrote the song together. Oh. And that was that was like a vision that we had. But um by the time so like Ron Tom was only really supposed to give us the space in the studio. But we left from Kentish Town and then we went to all we went to all Sa all Saints in um in uh, in uh, Westbourne Grove. So we ended up being in All Saints. And, is this uh, after signing to Virgin or is this? No, no, we hadn't even signed, but ah. Ken, he had to leave the studio in Kentish oh. Town. And then we ended up going to All Saints, All Saints Road. And he and he was in a basement there and we carried on. Yeah. And um, I probably wasn't so, I probably could stay in All Saints longer. So when I think about some of the songs that were made, I'd say to you, maybe... Um, uh, some of them, like uh, "Tell Me Why" and "Slow Down," were actually made in All Saints because it, it it was like a a, a long summer. So, say by March of '89, we we were in Kentish Town, and then probably by by September we were in All Saints. And then the times I got more memory of people coming to visit us in All Saints, like. Like Noddy and Linny Lynn, they after they finished work, they'd come down to the studio, they'd hear what what's being made. So the majority of the album, they it was um, they were ready to put vocals and stuff down, and then we had met Louise, and then I think Ron Tom was playing our stuff around, and um, that pricked up people's ears, and we still were talking soul to soul because like Jazzy used to go to Japan every every month. And me from eight, early 89, me and Noddy were supposed to go with Jazzy as a as a group to perform. And because but because like Eddie before, because of the success Jazzy was having, things were kind of a bit different. So Jazzy became aware of what we were doing as well. And he he was interested in us, but we weren't really sure, and then Eddie came back and was saying, "Look, uh, I've I've got interest. I'm interested in what you guys are doing." And um, Ron Tom decided to go to Ten Records, and we sat with uh, Mick Clark, who was the guy who famously signed uh, Jazzy. Um, he he um, something wasn't wasn't really didn't really work out, but you could see there was interest, but. Um, I can't remember the game. Tim Tim Reeves, I think his name is. He was the A and he was the the assistant for Mick Clark, and then he went to Virgin and was able to set up his own label. So we went back to not that we went back to him. It was like everyone was hearing our music, and then, I think I told you about this this guy that's not really spoken about a lot in the culture um, in the music industry, Danny Sims. He's like, it was weird because like a few months before, Jazzy was telling us about hanging out with this person who we called the Godfather, um, uh, Danny Sims, and uh, he that, that uh, Jazzy's manager was um, was uh, the road manager of um, the manager of Bob Marley, um, who he famously got shot on the stage. Don Taylor, Don Taylor, yeah. Don Taylor was the person who uh, assisted Jazzy. He um, he uh, he was the management of Jazzy, and Jazzy was telling us because he was he was interested in me and Noddy at the time, and he was telling us about his summer being chilling with Danny. And then it was kind of strange, like within a month or two, we're we're hanging out in Cannes with uh, with with Danny Sims and Smiley. And um, yeah, and then we 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 were almost like we had our we had our choice of labels. It was kind of it's a weird. It's a bit like how maybe a footballer a footballer with with an agent, and and they've got they've kind of got the choice of of what club they could go to. And then it's not not like it was a bidding war, but it's almost like yeah, you've got you've got the you've got a choice. Because there was a spark, uh, you could see there was a, a yeah. A, 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 it's very much documentary document the summer of love with house and all of that that was going yeah. on but also alongside that was this uk 
scene that's come from hip hop, yeah. not from ages ago, but just this a year or two previous. Yeah, 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 it was yeah definitely. A, almost a hip hop thing, but then there was this sung vocal element that was going on, and it just yeah. felt like, okay, this is coming to just be a, the new sound to, you yeah. know, to take us into the nineties. Ultimately, you, you brought me back to remember the other group that I wanted to mention that is very integral that um, doesn't get mentioned enough. Um, and it would be unfair of me not to, is the time when I had the vision and wanted, that's what I'm aspiring to do because of all the, all the, the music that I was listening to and wanted to, wanted to be a part of in a hip hop way. The group that I can't say if they were a hip hop group, but when I heard Smith and Mighty, oh, any, yes. anyone who had a heart, when I heard that song, in a sound system that Soul to Soul were playing. They you used to have soul sounds and reggae sounds. So there was a sound called Wisdom and they used to have this community hall in on a Sunday afternoon. And that was the same. That was like maybe between um, three and eight on a Sunday, we could all go to it. And we're, we're younger people and people even younger than me in my late teens by then. We, we I would hear this song and that proved to me that it could be done. So before we heard like um, uh, uh, Be Fair, Jazz, you know, Jazzy's, right, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, Fair Play, um, I heard uh, anyone who had a heart, and that that proved to me that it could be done. You know, so it more it more instilled in me that yeah, keep keep keep, keep, keep the faith alive. So it, that. Interesting as yeah. we're talking about this because but Bacrex just passed away and yes um, yeah and re yes. they, they yeah. did uh, they, they um the Wild Bunch which became Massive Attack and Nelly Hooper went to Soul to Soul did the Look of Love Bomb the Bass did I say a Little Prayer which was maybe eighty nine so a little bit later but Smith and Mighty yeah. were the initial one you know that it was just that UK fusion wasn't it it was yes hot, but you could see there was a reggae influence with it yes it very much off the moment of now isn't it yeah. And, yeah and then I guess that's what you you Massive Attack the syndicate did, came with original material as well isn't it that was yeah you know, I can't it's coming well, I was saying song. that yeah. we can only I can only speak for myself and I can see the similarity in Massive Attack but um like and I said it's the pre the language of sampling and this and that. It's just like we're just extending what we did on in the in the if what's now called clubs in the sound system culture. It's like we're kind of emulating that further into into production. And that that that's I would say that's where that's where it, for me that's where it, it came from. You know. So, so at that point you were like uh, you know there was a buzz and it, what can often happen with major labels if there's a scene that's going on and you're that people know look you're originators within that scene then lots of people can see so yeah you yeah hindsight and... you, didn't, you didn't really even you didn't really know or even plan that that's where it would be but it's kind of like um we got our opportunity like i was saying to you meeting people like bumping into business not in a venue in a bar in a club and we're like, yeah, every, we're all going to get put on, you know. Every we we can just see it, you can just feel. And we had we we were quiet. I mean, we weren't even doing many shows in '89. And like I said, I wasn't living at home. I kind of just lived out of a studio. And and we just had our head down, making making um, making the music. And then I think you know people like Ron Tom was just driving around London playing the music. And a lot of people were aware of what we what we were doing, even though it wasn't released. And um, that brought everyone to us. Yeah. And in in historical context, looking back now, I mean, it, it was. British black music, really, wasn't it? And it, you know, there was, yeah, was I think it's, in that. it's fair to say, it's fair it was to say, very British black, and and, yeah, and it's fair to say, hundred percent, yeah. yeah. And maybe one of the first times, you know, that it's it, it, it's a unique thing. It's not a British artist doing a version of American soul music. It was very much like there was look the influence of hip hop was there, but there was a sound that, that Americans couldn't do. The Americans, it's like what you, it's stuff. like what you're saying. Um, like what you're saying, Rob, it's like I went to America the first time in 88, but Lenny Lin, who was the younger rapper in the syndicate, the person who was on the left, the top left of that 
picture. His uh, his uh, uncles, um, his dad's um, uh, brother's family, they went to live in Mount Vernon in New York. And he had gone in 87. And I promised that I'd go with him in 88. And when he told me about, he already was, um, you know, the rap explosion, you could say, it more blew up even more in 88. But he was telling me when he went and was hanging out with his relatives who were even living in England before in Vernon, it's like they weren't really aware of the music. So like you might hear something like Heavy D. Heavy D was from Mount Vernon and they, they knew him. So they would talk about that song and Lenny would be telling them that's a song that Fingers would be cutting up or I'd hear it on a breakbeat tape or and they'd be like, no, no, that's Heavy D song. And it's like a lot of people weren't aware of where how the music became rap, the records and but Linny had a different sort of um a journey into it he could see the transition from the turntable culture into the recordings but a lot what he realized was that even though it's an american thing they a lot of the people who were consuming it didn't know didn't didn't experience that and didn't even know just like we had in England, they didn't know, like you know. But and the UK, the Brit, Brit in in the UK, there's a history yeah. there from Northern Soul there. Yeah, Black American. Yeah, we, we made deep, these artists, just like Public Enemy. We made <laughs> these groups bigger here before they got bigger there. Yeah. But the reason why I was saying all that stuff was to say that the law is in as a DJ, just like an MC, just like a break dancer or a body popper is original. You have to be original. Yeah. So that that uh, we we weren't we we weren't um, I mean we weren't we weren't uh, copying you weren't you couldn't copy you had to be original but the template the template is definitely set from from the culture of that came out of the uh, South Bronx and I, I guess that's what I always felt it's that the, the the original like a real UK sound so. You know, in years to come, yeah. you know, it happened with Jungle and Drum and Bass. That you know, they yeah. were major. Then later with Grime, you know, Wiley and yeah. Stephen I mean, all, all yeah. them things yeah. like yeah. From from my 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 observation, and I I can be wrong, but the way I observed it was that if there wasn't hip hop culture, you wouldn't have had Drum and Bass, and you wouldn't have had um, some of the other the other scenes. And I can see. I can see the influence of older music. I mean, today I thought of MC Shy D of all people. It's like uh, um, I was thinking like, yeah, that's someone uh, a bit like uh, MC Shaw that not like he's written out of history, but there was so much stuff that he was churning out in 80, 80, 83, 84, maybe 84. Um, but it was like 808, just 808 drum drum machine. You know what I mean? That some, you know, that um, that that could have become a genre now in itself. But all this stuff, like Mantronics, is a given that a lot of the triplet and the the drill trap stuff, there that's like Mantronics type type uh, production. But I can always see the thing. A lot of people always thought with changing the scenery that. I must have gone into drum and bass because they could see the potential for it. But it, it's like my thing is it's all hip hop, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be in a, in a specific genre. But I suppose you can't escape it. But, but, but also at yeah. that time there, there was, um, I mean, I, I would refer to it as fast rap. There was Big Daddy K and Ace and Yes, and, and yes. We, the yeah. UK was arena, but so you, it wasn't. You were listening to that. It's it's, uh, it's a UK. And we were all dancing to it when the yeah. phenomenon wasn't so big with the break dances because people have to realize of a certain age that the break dance thing is still prominent now. But there was a period when it wasn't has has major. Uh, you know, there was a big there was a big um, you know a big craze, but by ATA it wasn't such a craze. You know, I saw people like Paris City Breakers in Paris still breaking and Assassin and Sol uh, Solar, Solar, who became Assassin and N NTM. These guys, they were all break dancers, but they all became MCs. And I started seeing that in the UK. A lot of people 
you know, Dope Dobby D, a lot of people who became became, you know, even London Posse, you know, Bionic, you know, they they all became more MCs. And maybe they were MCs, because like I said, they're from South, so I didn't know them, but it seemed like that became more the 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 attention for them. It's it's like rap became the main thing in hip hop when we yeah. refer to hip hop. But also with the drum, the drums, you know, it was normal to have fast drum. I mean, your your drums were sort of sampled by the Prodigy as well, weren't they? So. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, still, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 also, I mean, you mentioned we met talking about the Demon Boys earlier. They they you know they uh, linked with Re Rebel MC, Congo Natty. Yeah. And, you know, that yeah. was a prototype. Yeah. You know, the jungle. There was a hip hop almost. Yeah, Rebel, Rebel is still doing it. My my yeah. son had a poster of of the a show that he'd gone to like maybe 2016 or whatever 17 which was uh, uh it seems like rebel still does the drum yeah, and bass thing as well yeah, so, yeah yeah i mean yeah that, i think that's the one thing that i feel there was a real interesting part of history there so yeah you, so you signed to you saw you're 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 signed to Virgin Direct. There's Soul to Soul signed to Ten with Mick Clark. Yeah, Massive yeah. Attack was signed to Circa, and then it got in. Circa yeah, got they were Virgin. kind of being so you're distributed. You're on three different. You're on three different labels, but all within Virgin. All at the same right? time, yeah, 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 yeah. It was kind of a funny thing. Like, like personally for me, when I'm on Virgin and uh, gone to visit them for the first time, I remember a group like I Level. And I'm thinking, imagine that it's like I had this record, Give Me, which I loved, Give Me, Eye Level, which was a song that um, I'm not even sure where they were from, but Eye Level, um, they had a song called Give Me, which was the, the, their first yeah, single. Yeah, funk, wasn't it? But yeah, but the album, was, wasn't it? The album yeah, has like... got, a it's got a unique sound, yeah. not not quite like a Sade sound, but um, the... That song stood out. When I bought the album, I wasn't as liking it as much as the Give Me. But that song was able to even have a Shep Pettibone mix, I think. And maybe they broke through in America, that song, um, Give Me. But knowing at the knowing later on that yeah, they, these guys are on Virgin as well, that's like crazy, yeah. It was a crazy thing to imagine. But but not not saying that um Virgin we we you know I I became friends with Marcia. Uh, we were explaining with uh, Ijoma, like how we had this weird synchronicity. But we had, we were, I was recording stuff about twenty years ago with Marcia Escoffery, and um, she. I was telling her the label that she was signed to. We we were talking with them. We could have signed to them, but we we just thought we're in All Saints Road because Danny Sims took us to took us to um, Cannes with Smiley, Smiley and Danny and uh, Danny Sims' brother. And we had these famous places like the Carlton and just seeing everybody there. Like a weird one, and Noddy was the guy who took all the pictures. Like we're hanging out with um, uh, uh, Tupac's group, but Did we didn't know. Yeah, you didn't know Tupac, but Tupac, you're right there with him, but he wasn't known in 1989. He was part of the digital underground and he became Tupac uh, by the time 92, better, Brenda had a baby. That's when for us, he became Tupac. But yeah, we, we were rubbing shoulders with all these uh, people who were doing showcases in uh, uh, January 91. And Danny Sims was having all these meetings. Tim Registered was Motown at the time. You could have been, and he knew all these people like, like Jazzy in his documentary talks about Johnny, Johnny Cocker pushing his music in America. And the music was a bit different. We learned from Jazzy, uh, from Danny Sims, who took us under his wing. Like he's like a manager's manager. And like, you know, later on reading bits of history, I realised that Danny Sim, when I looked at Danny, I thought I didn't actually know my father. And I thought this man could even be my father because why is all this stuff happening with all these breaks we're having? But Danny Sims, you got to learn how powerful he was. And he was saying that there was a bit of weight. He was saying that the whole entertainment industry is almost like, like get full of gangsters and they at that time they put a lot of weight they they put pressure on people to play your music so johnny i think his name johnny johnny cochran 
Like Jazzy, I watched a documentary recently with Jazzy on Sky Arts and he spoke about Johnny Cochran. And I was like, okay, yeah, it makes sense because at the time, Johnny Cochran was doing a show on Capital Radio even. And like he, he changed, they had this relationship where a, a, an American DJ came over and he was doing a show and he showcased in Vogue at that time in Vogue were just breaking through and he showcased the single of in Vogue on there. And then Danny brought us to meet Johnny Cochran, but he was telling, Danny was telling us in the sixties, we would force these guys or seventies, we'd force these guys to play, play the music. So a lot of the black music that was being played, it's like, it wasn't really like a payola thing from my from yeah. my interpretation, it was almost like they got these guys to play in what in by any means they got them to play. But that that's um, what I learned from. So you were linked yeah. in with someone with a, with some um, weight, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Danny, Danny, yeah. Um, we could have signed to any any Atlantic, Capital, Motown, and uh, Will Ashen had come to see us from Virgin. He'd come to see us in All Saints the studio, and he was saying like, look, we you know, we really, really like what you're doing. I have a memory of him telling us they were, they wanted to sign NWA, but because NWA abbreviated their name, they was unsure. So I think he was trying to show us that they're really down with the kids or whatever. <laughs> so, like, um, it was only when we came back, like, um, from Cannes, we decided, like, yeah, we like Virgin because, and they were just down the road. You know, we're All Saints Road, Holloway Road, and we, you know, um, Harrow Road. And we just thought, yeah, let's go with Virgin. It wasn't for any other reason. It's like, you know, people might think, oh, you know, you 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 were on there because Jazzy was on 10. It, it kind of was nothing, nothing to do with that. Ron Tom had tried before. Like I said, the summer before, but it was it was because um, they were they were close, and we already had Will Ashen personally came and spoke spoke to us. So we were like, yeah, it's it's a fit. So did you it's get any fit. once you were signed? Did you get any pressure about what direction you need to go? Or were you allowed to just well, do your own thing? The, you, the thing is, the album was made. It's a, it's kind of like a similar thing. I don't know if it's fair to say it now. It's a similar thing with with. Um, the interest we had from you, we like just uh, Ijoma was saying, we were about to just put it out like we always did. We had this vision. Uh, Ijoma went to live in New York. Um, you know, maybe I'm going off off topic. No, that's but, all right. That's the new yeah. album we're about to do and treat. Yeah, you. yeah. So <laughs> we Which made basically the you album. did, and you sent to us. Yeah, we, we made. And yeah, out. we made the album. Yeah. So it was a similar thing with Virgin like people may not know we made the album yeah. and uh that was why we had interest from so many different places and we just thought um when we made the album uh and it was released and we did the first tour we were fortunate to be the support group for soul to soul on the uk tour pardon me uk tour we um i'd say to you and i i i mentioned it to someone yesterday I was speaking to like it was only um when we made the first album uh I'd say yes when we had made the first album and uh it was like they were always looking at another another tell me why or a slow down which it, it in a way you don't really mind because it's part of our sound but it's almost like the music that we were making like we were still making new music like uh there's there's a track we made that never came out uh, uh that became it's kind of become the property of um Ferdy at uh, Goby he has these free recordings we made and there was a song we made called Levels we we still were going a bit a bit hard rhythmic but a bit hard but not necessarily blatant we always had the reggae influence it's just part of it and maybe it's obvious now with the new stuff we 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 we're honored to have with you is um the blues maybe it's the blues that's always been there <laughs> more than um yeah i think i think i think that's what i'm becoming to realize myself really i mean you were you were just doing your thing 
Virgin and that you know yeah. you, you did what you did. I mean, I've got this record. I mean, this is one of my Simple Jealousy by the Syndicate, which is one of my all time favorite records. I, I still to this day, I, 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 every year without fail, I play it on the radio, and I, I think I almost all the time say I've still never heard a record that sounds like this. It's such a, yeah. I mean, it's a strange. I've got a version. I promised you, and it's only because I've got it on DAP, and I need to get my DAP machine is broken. You know, I somehow I can get I get get it off the dat and I'll get it to you. Yeah, but but, but you but, know, I promise you a version. I've got an alternative version. Yeah, of I would it. love because it, because it's it, uh, what I love with with records like this is you hear everything in it, but you also don't know where is this coming from. It's the double no. vocals and you know it, it just so much fusion going on. And and, and to me, I, I mean, I didn't really understand. I was quite young and it just come to Brighton to study. So I'd, I'd just begun DJing out, I was DJing at bars and not quite DJing at clubs to, at, at that point in my life. But I would see like, okay, well, Soul to Soul have crossed over and Omar's crossed. Why does this, why is it not big? Yeah. Why is it, I, I guess in hindsight, I can see it's quite a out there record, but not an out there record as well, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, I, it, I it is it. a lot of fun yeah. making it, yeah. but it was like a, yeah, it was like you you could feel like things aren't going to stay the same. We we um yeah, I, I, maybe a lot of uh, many things at once happened like at that that time it's a bit like where we're at now like where you've got the Ukraine as the major war in the world is the Ukraine war. We had the first Gulf War at the time that Janet Jackson had signed to Virgin for like he heard some crazy 50 million and it was like you could feel like okay we're actually we're on a retainer now and you know we we basically five five or how many of us were in the group we all lived together in the house so it was like uh me uh myself uh don't ramp the other producer and um louise we were like a tighter unit than the other three and we always creatively working together but we always thought of different ways to do things so louise had the idea to get spiky t together you know to sing this let's sing this thing together and, and um i think at the time as well with what was going on it because that was 1990 as a recall wasn't it but if you think what was really happening then because yeah. of soul to soul particularly and also massive yeah. time, you know, this 90 BPM slow soul thing was just yeah. everywhere, wasn't it? It was, it was the dance, the dancing thing, you know. Yeah. And like, that was the fast the, record, wasn't it? That was really Yeah, I mean, like, we, we had these, the <laughs> best dancers, like, uh, they were the dancers that you saw, Hudson and Dean. We used to hang out with a group of uh, different rap groups in uh, West London. We really had this big West London affiliation. And... Um, the dancers who dance for I Got the Power, um, that group, um, Hudson and Dean, we called them. They were our, they were our dancers. Uh, we was easy, we you know they were our friends. You know, like you know, so um, we had um, another group called Revs per minute or uh, uh, routines per minute. Uh, but when we were invited to be on the tour, and it's through the affiliation, you know, the soul to soul affiliation with Danny Sims and Don Taylor that it, we were it, we were going to be part of the tour. Which um, was that? The, the, the Soul to Soul, oh. Soul to Soul tour, like they originally, the only tour they ever did at that time, yeah. which, you know, Brixton Academy, uh, Wem uh, Wembley, I, I imagine, um, other, other places, Newcastle and other, it was probably about 12, 12 dates we did um, the summer of uh, 90 when, um, and that was what introduced us as well. We weren't allowed, you know, no, no diss to Jazzy, we, but we weren't allowed to have our dancers. We were allowed to do, we could come with our band, you know, and but we weren't allowed to have the dancers. But that aspect for us was always there, the, the thing. And um, we, if there was any music that I was listening to, it was these bands like uh, these sound system uh I, I can't, it doesn't come, I'm having a senior moment, so I can't even think of the, the names, but we definitely were into all aspects of um, of the UK culture then, which was, um, you know, which which definitely they could have called Jungle or whatever, but not saying that I was trying to make that, it was because like, I could see the relationship, it's just like, okay. I mean, it, yeah. I think it's what, 
interesting. And there's so many producers in the UK. You're soaking up all the energy from all different scenes. Yeah, and yeah. UK's brilliant at just few. You fight. We always have these generations of producers who can just fuse it all together almost effortlessly. There's a little yeah. bit where it's not quite there, but there's a point where it just clicks in and becomes, you know, dubstep or grind. Yeah. Jungle, or you yes. know, counter soul, or massive attack, almost genres yeah. within themselves, isn't it? And you, you were part of that. And, and I mean, at that time, I mean, you would do. I guess you. I mean, looking online just before I did this, you did the word as well, didn't you? Which was, I yeah, guess, yeah, yeah. Before the word became culture program, before it became the word, it, we yeah. we did the word before before everyone knew the word. It could have been the second or third episode. We we did it, and I think the day that we did it, I had. When I was in school, like five years before, I'd bitten into a burger and I bit into a bit of stone in the burger. So I cracked a tooth and I just lived with this pain for, for years. Um, and then that day I got the tooth taken out. So if you watch the word, you may think it's me djing on the word but it's actually don't ramp. And people used to, th people used to think we were brothers. We, we were so close. You know, and, and there's a funny link because Don't Ramp's dad was very uh, good friends with Jazzy B's dad. And my stepdad is from Antigua, just like Don't Ramp's family were from Antigua. Antigua is such a small island, everybody. We, we could be at a family gathering like last year and my dad would just talk to some girl and, and then he'd say, oh, she's, she's, I know her parents or whatever. It's so small like an island and he come from a place called Liberta. But Jazzy Jazzy and Don't Ramp's uh, family kinda of knew each other in but um we I don't know if Jazzy actually knew Don't Ramp, but he always saw us together and he'd always be, you know, let us come into his venues or be really cool, accommodating and always mention us. You know, people like Daddy's Daddy Harvey, he'd always mention us on the mic. And you know, say, oh, you know, I can see fingers there or whatever. They all always really cool, really cool, cool so, guys. But yeah, yeah. So at that point, you're just, um, you know, you've done the music, and I guess look, we're probably running out of time a little bit, so we've yeah, probably sorry. Been so you've done the music, and I guess that's probably like historically what we know. It's maybe not crossed over to levels. You're just you were talking about Janet Jackson yeah. coming in and Virgin and yeah. all that. So so what what happened? What ha what happens is a group. It's weird a because table. we we, we were on a retainer. We had we had the um, we actually had. Um, I'd say with simple jealousy, you could say just like how we feel we are now. I feel like from the time of simple jealousy to where we are now again with the syndicate and idioma, I, I, I say that where I feel like I'm in that place where I was with when we did simple jealousy, like, um, like I always, um, I'd say like when we, when we were coming off a of virgin, there were things like, I, I never said to you, like when, when we made simple jealousy, I wanted to continue working. Uh, I wanted to work with uh, to Toby Baker, who was the keyboardist that I used on Slow Down. And Toby was really rude to the A and R guy, so he was like, "You, you I'm not going to allow you because the budget. We're not going to let you spend that money." So I mean, secretly, there were songs that I made that I made with Toby, but when we went into the studio to record Simple Jealousy, we had to work with, um, literally had to work with Simon Law. And I wasn't feeling uh, Simon Law. And when we presented the track to him and he was going to play on it, we said to him, we don't want that playing. We want like bebop. We want some serious bebop jazz uh, oh, pianist. Wow. Go so we got, the ja we got the Jazz Warriors. Uh, our management got uh, got got jazz warriors to come and play on it and um and he delivered what we wanted and then we 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 imagined the horns so it was like okay ja uh, our management jackie she knew uh there was a connection with ub40 so she got ub40's horns to come in and put that put the horns down and it, it's like um it's a good it's a good um yeah, they're good. Good. It's a it's a good memory and a good uh, how do you say it? like an experience to have yeah. to to be going forward now 
and to be but I, 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 that, to answer your question at the time is recording that after we made that there were a few little think funny things that were happening like spiky t he he was going to have his first child we all lived together and we, we were begging him you know stay stay in the house with us we'll all support each other and um maybe financially we were just like on the edge living together and just managing with a little bit of money and um he decided that he wanted to leave the band so he left the band and then um like i said we were on this retainer i went to new york for the second time with my with my dad and um was staying in new jersey with my mum's family and uh then while we were in in new, in while we were on holiday i heard that we had been we'd been let go Okay. We've been let go, and um, you know, you never hear when artists get let go of, from a label. You you just notice after a while that oh, maybe they're not on the label anymore. Yeah, yeah. But by the time people had known, and it had been known, I was probably um, had did the single that was for Conscious Music. W could have been could have been tracks on the new Syndicate album, but we just recorded them, re-recorded them, and put them out on an independent. Some guys that we knew. Uh, through Ron Tom independently. We had options. We were talking with Go B, the label Virgin at prior. I think we kept on saying no, which made it easier. The, they wanted me to work with uh, PM Dawn. Uh, after we'd done Simple Jealousy and we made these, uh, and we were like, how can we work with PM Dawn? It's like, we, we're nowhere, we're not, we're nowhere in that same bracket, yeah. you know? So I think that's probably helped them you know Make the decision. i mean yeah. I, guess I know from working you're, you're quite singular in your vision and i think look from working with you and seeing what you're about and what has gone on in a way i think that's why your music is so good because you you've got your vision and you almost you don't really need sort of an a and r in that sense or someone to come and tell you what to do it's like it's your vision like, this is what i'm feeling and that's what's happening isn't it i mean that yeah it's almost people just throwing names at things to try no, but, but, <laughs> but we me me and Nijoma, we we trust you and 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 you know in hindsight we look at certain things and we like we let certain we got to let certain things go but i think i i'd say the only reason why we could possibly be sounding unique um even now was i i try not to listen to to um much music and i love i love um uh the the underground rap and you've introduced me to west side gun and they've been they've been going a while but you've introduced me to them it's like i heard you talk about them and i looked at them and I'm, i got it straight away and you know they've come here before I wasn't I wasn't aware of what they were doing, but I've heard I've looked. You know, YouTube keep sending me new things, and I'm like, yeah, I love that. But I love it for them. I don't necessarily love it for myself. But I get it. As soon as I heard it, I was yeah. like, yeah, it's 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 New York, but it's you know upstate. Buffalo, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I love it, I love it. And it's but, all and it's hip hop, isn't it? I know you're yeah. in the soul and the funk yeah, and yeah, all yeah. of that stuff in the but world. I, I love, I love everything that I hear of what people are doing, but I love it. Maybe it's for them. It's not like I want to be that. But I think the only reason why, like I say, possibly we people might think we sound a bit unique is because I wasn't listening. I'm not listening to anything other than obviously I've got all these records upstairs in here. Like, but it's like you still. <clears throat> You know, like I say to everybody, everyone's got an album in them, but it's like there's so much ideas that come from term tableism, like for me, and and it's the basis. And then with with the machines that I would use to try to, you know, like I just look at it like a recorder. Sorry, I know I'm just waffling. Yeah, sorry. No, 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 no it's but all yeah, good. It's, it's, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, it's and I, I think that's it. It, it, it's, it. I think it's the best thing because I, I know sometimes even from a, from a Point of view a record label from an a and r point of view um i'm always interested in demos that you're just you you know when we first broke bonobo and then quantic and then high brass band high brass band you know I, I was getting brass band demos for years and it was like we can't you know we've got high brass band we don't really need yeah, yeah. Brass band. and then with bonobo i used to get sound like you know that sound like him it's like well, we've got this album we don't so yeah, always, this yeah, always interests yeah. me is like and i think that was the interesting when when you sent me your music it was like 
oh god we not only have we never released anything like this on true thoughts i i've never really heard a uk album like this that's a soul album that you know is so cohesive but is doing something that's the influence you know the roots of so much music but it's very much of the moment so i I think you know that's something that what of why I've always loved you and to be able to yeah. carry it. And, and I think the other thing that I love is working with experienced producers and I think there's something where producers are look it's great look we want to sign young producers and give them their journey and help yeah. them with it. but I think that experience you have as an older producer you can really bring something and there's a knowledge and I'm, I'm gonna say to you though like and the musicians they'll back me up uh, if ever you communicate with them it's like I always tell them that I feel like I learned the word from Jess but you know I feel like I'm I'm an imposter I still feel like I've got so much to learn I feel like you know I'm I'm here this is what I always wanted to do when I was from I was in school you know I I, I see I, I look at the producers you know and the records Norman Whitfield you know Barrett Strong he just passed away I look at all these people and I'm like yeah like I, I want to be that, but yeah. you know, she's still hungry. I think that's one yeah, of the best things yeah. to be as a producer, though, isn't it? It's yeah. still to don't rest on your. It's like a puzzle. I don't feel like I've done. I haven't. I haven't done it. I'm still. You're still trying to work it out, but you know, you're lucky to share it while you're working it out. So look, yeah. it's been really fascinating talking to you, Carl. And look, yeah, so um, just check out the, depending when you're listening to, or, or, or watching this, check out the new The Syndicate and Idioma album. We've done we've done a little reissue of Stan Tall um, now on True Thoughts, but we're really looking forward to getting this album and sh- sharing it with the world as well. So thank you. Been a really fascinating time. And then we're going to do another, once the album's out, we're going to do another uh, conversation with you and Idioma sure. talking about the album in a bit more detail. But the history History of this, I, I feel really privileged to have heard the story of you know what has gone on and what's happened with um, the music and your journey so far. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>